80 acres of land for Eaton Park was purchased from the church in 1906, but it wasn't until 1924 that construction began, with the park officially opened in 1928. The park, along with the bandstand and pavilions, lily pond, model boat lake and boat lake pavilion were designed by Arnold Edward Sandys Winch. Sandys Winch was articled to landscape architect Thomas Mawson. Mawson's book, The Art and Craft of Garden Making, was an inspiration for Edwin Lutyens and Gertrude Jekyll, who were involved in the arts and craft movement. Lutyens was also responsible for the superb checkerboard Grosvenor Estate in London. Nineteen nineteen saw Sandis Winch employed as Norwich's Park Superintendent, a position he held for thirty four years. At his appointment, Norwich was not blessed with open spaces, but on his retirement, over six hundred acres of parkland and open spaces had been amassed for the city. As stated earlier, work on Eton began in nineteen twenty four, a period of high countrywide unemployment. Those out of work between 1920 and 1940 numbered 1 million at its lowest level, reaching a zenith of above 3 million in 1933, 22% of the working population. A governmental committee on unemployment was set up in 1920, which established the Unemployment Grants Committee. The committee recommended public work schemes to tackle unemployment, and it was through this recommendation and funding that much of the labour for Eaton Park was found from Norwich's jobless, with reports suggesting 103 men were employed on the park's construction. Of course, not everyone was enamoured with this utilisation of public money. Yarnmouth Independent, Saturday 27th February 1927 under the guise of providing work for the unemployed, the Labour Party brought forward a scheme to develop Eaton Park, which has cost the city £64,000. That was a monument of socialist extravagance. If that money had been spent on building houses, the housing problem today would have been in a much more satisfactory condition than it is. If that 64,000 had been spent on building houses, it would have been a source of revenue in rates and in rents. What would Eaton Park produce from a recreation point of view? Viewed from above, the bandstand amphitheatre could perhaps pass for the head of a tennis racket, with the lily pond forming the shaft, model boat pond the handle and boating pavilion to prevent the racket slipping out of hand, which is appropriate for a park dedicated to sport. You have to squint quite heavily for this flight of fancy though. Returning my head from the clouds, one can't examine the bandstand in isolation. The seating and pavilions are intrinsic in creating the most impressive bandstand experience I've encountered in the UK. But let's begin with the bandstand. The copper dome rests on entablature supported by Tuscan columns standing upon a stepped plinth, married together in the classical architecture style. The classical style is derived from ancient Greece and Rome, and in its simplest form consists of columns supporting entablature. An entablature is a structural support spanning columns, usually consisting of three main sections. Lower band or architrave, middle band or frieze, and upper band or cornice. Eaton's Tuscan column sit on a base, whereas its close relative, the Grecian Doric column, is baseless. A fine example being Penshaw Monument west of Sunderland. Penshaw's Doric columns are smooth rather than the usual fluted style. However, neither Tuscan nor Doric columns have their clean lines broken by carvings or adornments. Surrounding the bandstand are three rows of interlocked wooden benches, which provide seating for nearly 1,000 people. Completing Sandy's Winch's design is a quadrant of pavilions, like the bandstand, constructed of colour washed stone and concrete. A step plinth grounds more Tuscan columns supporting an entablature with balustrade above. Piers atop each column give the balustrade an air of solidity. 
Balustrades consist of a row of small columns or balusters capped by a rail. The colonnade houses doorways with panelled doors featuring fan lights. The windows are mullion and transom design and behind each Tuscan column is a pilaster. A colonnade is formed from the space beneath an entablature and between its supporting columns. Mullions are thin vertical divisions between adjacent glass in a window or between a group of windows. A transom is a structural beam supporting a door from the window above it. A pilaster is a shallow rectangular column protruding from the wall in which it is set. Although pilasters can be structural, they tend to be decorative, employed to remove the plainness of an empty stretch of wall. Changing rooms for the many sports played at Eaton Park were the predominant role of the pavilions, but one pavilion housed a tea room. Yarnmouth Independent, Saturday, December 31st, 1927. The big amphitheatre-like structure in the centre provides dressing room accommodation for the clubs using the park. The flat roof can be utilised for teas served from the underneath restaurant. The pavilion's flat roof also supplied a vantage point from which to watch the bands perform. While wandering through the park back to the train station I spoke to a local couple who informed me the number of Eaton's tennis courts had reduced over time, there being 12 originally. The number stated when the Yarmouth Independent of Saturday December 5th 1925 reported the Employment Committee recommended the Everyday Hard Tennis's company's tender for the courts to be accepted. The bid consisted of Supplying, laying etc. Everyday surface material for hard tennis courts at the rate of 2 shillings 10 pence per yard super and also for providing 12 seats of moor free markings at 14 pounds 14 shillings per set making a grand total estimated cost of 1307 pounds 14 shillings and 8 pence Norwich can boast another, more traditional bandstand situated in Chapelfield Gardens. The gardens preceded Eton, becoming a park in about 1850, with a bandstand erected in 1899, and provides another reason, if one is needed, to visit Norwich. <laughs> 